Hello class, hope we're all doing well. Uh, it's the first recorded respiratory lecture and I will be going through the beginning slides, although I had uh, given those in class and then we'll get to some new stuff. And if you look, you have your lab for this week is up. I recorded four little mini lectures in there to describe all of the breathing uh, experiments that we would have done and some, some cool stuff. So, all right, let's begin. So again, uh, breathing, we, uh, we take in about half a liter of air with each normal shallow breath. And already in our lungs, there's two, two and a half liters in there. So we're just really mixing some fresh air with a lot of dead air. And as we'll see quickly, uh, the percentage of oxygen out here in this room is 160, and then deep in our lungs is 104. And so we always just kind of refresh the air a little bit, but we don't completely replace it. As I mentioned, birds have a much more efficient respiratory system where they take in new air and it goes through air sacs and it's just a one-way flow. We have this tidal flow back and forth and it works. Um, and we have the ability to speed it up or slow it down, take deeper, shallower breaths to adjust to um, our needs. All right, so breathing, ventilation is moving the air in and out. So again, it's a negative pressure system. And uh, all that we do is we make our chest bigger, and that's going to make a vacuum. It's going to decrease the pressure inside our chest. And the pressure of the air around us in the atmosphere is going to push the air in, and our, our lungs will fill. On the other hand, when, I, when we exhale, the chest cavity gets smaller, and uh, the pressure increases just a little bit, and that's enough to push the air out. And it's Boyle's Law, physics, it's that volume and pressure are inversely related. So less volume, more pressure, and the air, just like the blood, always goes from area of high to low pressure. And that's how it moves in and out. And uh, here at sea level, it's the pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. It's also called one atmosphere. And that's just the standard right here. And as you go higher up in the elevation, that's going to get less and less. But um, so we have here, and what we do inside our chest is simply lower it. You can see just two millimeters mercury, just a little bit, but that's enough for the air to rush in from the higher pressure in the room. And we do so mostly by our diaphragm contracting, and then also our chest muscles can, can make our chest uh, bigger. Uh, if you really need to suck in the air, um, you'll hang on to something and use your chest muscles and neck muscles uh, uh, to, to more deeply breathe. Yeah, and there's the diaphragm. Weird muscle. It uh, originates from the rib cage and your vertebrae in the back and inserts on itself in a tendon right in the middle. You can see that. Oops. And there we go. This tendon in the middle. Yeah. And so when the muscle contracts around the edges, it pulls down on that. And it pushes our guts, our liver, and our intestines, everything. It pushes it down. And then uh, you're going to see it kind of snaps back up passively when those organs um, release that uh, pressure from being uh, contracted like that. But the diaphragm, again, the phrenic nerve comes off of your uh, cervical region, which is weird because it should come down much lower. But in evolution, these muscles uh, started up in the neck and they migrated down and this nerve just followed it all the way down. And again, the reason why the lungs inflate at all is that you have a, a wet membrane on a wet membrane that stick together, a cohesive. And uh, as the chest expands, that uh, visceral pleura is going to be stuck on the parietal pleura. And when you pull the chest away, it's going to make a vacuum. It's going to make it suck harder. It's going to be pulled out like that. So as long as you have that adhesion along the surface of the lung and the inside of the chest, the lungs will, will expand. So there you go, chart, going through everything I just said, no problem. Now breathing out, I say, is more passive. And you have stretched the lungs and the elastic fibers in it have been stretched and so they want to snap back. And as you saw in the demonstration of lab, if you remember that pig lung expanding and, and, uh, and collapsing, that's the kind of the look. I, I used energy to, to blow it up and then I just naturally wanted to, to ball up again. And so, yeah. And all you need to do is the intrathoracic pressure needs to be just a little bit higher. You see just one millimeter of mercury 
and that's enough. The air is going to go from the high to the lower pressure in the room, and the air would be expired. And if you really need to get rid of the air, you can uh, use your abdominal muscles to help push your guts to get rid of, get rid of the air, and other muscles to forcibly decrease your chest uh, volume. Yeah, and like I, you should know that um, uh, as you sit up, your guts, your stomach, your liver, they're going to sag down and they're going to make it easier to breathe. Uh, when you're laying down, all those guts tend to push up on the diaphragm. It takes more energy for that diaphragm to push them back, to push them back. Yeah. And interestingly, we, we walk upright, but I mentioned quickly about cheetahs and racehorses, how they they, with each stride, actually their chest gets bigger with each stride, and as the strides come together, it helps push the, the air out. And if you're interested, you can look up how crocodilians, how their liver works as a piston. It goes back and forth to push the air out when they're, they're moving quickly. Good stuff. Yes. And positive pressure, we can use that with a, this kind of ventilator here, you can see. But uh, it's what uh, other animals do, like frogs. They forcibly swallow the air down instead of making a vacuum. And pneumothorax, and you'll hear in the medical field, at atelectasis is where you have a collapsed lung and, and the blood vessel actually collapse and uh, not a good situation at all. But if you have any kind of puncture of what it should be, you know, a um, airproof membrane, then uh, when you expand the, 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 the lung cavity, well, the air could just come in through that hole and uh, the lung is going to remain uh, collapsed and the, as the chest moves. And so and they're independent. You could have one collapsed lung and the other one could be fine. I also mentioned the lungs go all in the neck. So sometimes even a stab wound in the neck can puncture the lung. It seems higher than you would, you would think. So pneumothorax, having air in the chest cavity. Hemothorax would be having a blood that, that gathers in there. Oh, I think this is where I, I, I left off maybe in my, my lecture, looking at spirometry. So you guys need to be experts at this, uh, know what all these mean. Uh, we've learned it in lab. You'll look at it in lab again this week. But again, you can just see um, it's not, a, it shouldn't be a lot of formulas to memorize anything like that it should be pretty common sense if you think about this and take a look so uh, i'll just show you looking at the this normal tidal volume that's going to be the uh the normal breathing in and out it's about half a liter yeah like that and you have the ability that's just for normal resting but as you guys are active we do physical activity you can really crank it up so that's just the, the minimum you can do just resting breathing you also, if you wanted to breathe in, instead of a half a liter, you can breathe in a couple more liters, three liters maybe. Look at that, that's your inspiratory reserve. You've got that in reserve, you can use it. Let's say you really need a lot of breath, you're on the treadmill, you can crank it up and make your tidal volume much bigger because you have that reserve. And the expiratory reserve is less, but you can also, uh, if you have more air, you can breathe out of the lungs. So this little reserve allows you to go from you know, normal activity to high aerobic activity and be able to really crank up the amount of air you can ventilate your lungs with. Yeah, very cool. And you all know that when you look at the, take the deepest breath and then blow out as hard as you can, that is your vital capacity. That is your vital capacity. That is the, uh, depends on the person, like your, your anatomy, your lungs. And in the lab, you'll see uh, all these things um, often based looking at age, sex, and your height. But there's variables, everyone has a different shape, but it's how big your lungs are, so what the volumes are, definitely. And you think to yourself, well, that must be all the air that I can breathe completely in and out, that my vital capacity. That must be my lung capacity, but it's not, because you guys know that you've got this residual volume. You've got this volume, liter, 1200 milliliters of air, that you just can't blow out of your lungs, it's always, the air that's in there. So we can't measure that in, in lab with our standard equipment. Um, and you add that residual volume that you can't blow out with your vital capacity, and that's your total lung capacity. So if you take the deepest breath in, you know, how much air can fill your lungs? Be your total lung capacity. And if you try to breathe out completely, 
that would be your vital capacity because you cannot blow out that little residual amount. Well, little, 1,200, 1,500 milliliters. Yeah. Cool. So that's uh, basically once you get that, um, you understand these volumes. Capacities are when you add a couple volumes together like that. But these are standard uh, measures that are done using spirometry, using that equipment that, uh, that we use. And you can actually see some old-fashioned equipment here that um, actually really old uh, yeah this thing so um, for a while we've been able to measure the volume uh, volumes involved in lung function yeah and the lab really will get into it yeah cool all right so here um, we talked about cardiac output in the, the last section and that was heart rate times stroke volume so that's going to tell you how much blood is pumped out of your heart per minute now what about air it's the same thing it's just going to be uh, breathing rate times tidal volume yeah so if you're just breathing quietly that's the amount of air that's going to uh, go through your lungs just like if you're looking at your runner looking at your speed it's going to be stride length times number of strides per minute so if you're a person with longer legs you can go further or if you're just faster at making a stride your muscles make your legs move faster so it's just how rates are done and just if you just you know throw in some numbers you know tidal volume is about, about about half a liter and then you know, 12 breaths per minute very resting rates we'll give you yeah cool about six liters per minute and these things remember the amount of blood through your heart is about five liters per minute too so well, these things are all <laughs> Hopefully that'll help you remember uh, as, a, as a ballpark. So this minute ventilation, you can obviously increase it by either breathing more rapidly or breathing more deeply or both, right? So you can have shallow, rapid breathing, or you can have slow, deep breathing. We'll give you the same minute ventilation, right? So we have two variables to work with, just like your heart. We can increase the heart rate, and then the stroke volume is how much blood can be is pumped out. In this case, in breathing, it's much more uh, plastic, much more variable, because you can you're, the amount of air you can breathe out in a breath it, it can vary much more than, than the amount your heart can can pump out in one beat, if you remember. Yeah. So this uh, minute ventilation, easy. How much air you know you're exchanging in your lungs, but then to be really precise about it, what really matters is how much air reaches the alveoli for to be able to be diffused into your bloodstream and you've got to subtract the dead air all right so with each breath i take in i take in about 500 milliliters about 150 milliliters of that is it's going to be kept in my in my trachea and my bronchi and even bronchioles until you get to respiratory bronchioles remember there's no exchange so all this air that comes i breathe in and out just stays in my tubes and doesn't reach deep into my lungs so that's called the dead space. That'd be the anatomic dead space I'm mentioning. And if you have uh, issues with your lungs, you can have what's, what's, what's called, um, uh, well, the total physiological dead space includes that plus parts of your lung that are, are damaged. So they're, they're not being able to be used in, 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 uh, in gas exchange. And so together, this physiological dead space, you're gonna have always um, um, anatomical it's just the normal the air is, is trapped in those tubes so we can talk about alveolar ventilation rate so if you really care about you know how um, how much air is, is available to be exchanged and so you look at someone's oxygen content in their blood and it's it's low you're like well what's the uh, alveolar ventilation rate it's how much air is getting down deep into your lungs so it's just going to be minute ventilation minus that dead space. Yeah. And just to show you, you know, like, like how that comes into play here, you can look um, normal minute ventilation is just measuring how much air is coming in and out of your, uh, your mouth or your nose. Um, and so you take the number of breaths times that volume straight up. But uh, alveolar subtracts the dead space. That's 150 mils. So something to keep in mind, and it's a more specific uh, measure that's more physiologically relevant 
because of what's going on deep in your lungs. And if you hyperventilate, you can, you know, crank up your breaths per minute, uh, or you can hypoventilate and breathe slower. And you're going to bring that down. This number will go down. And then uh, this 500 mils for your tidal volume, you can crank that up to a liter, a liter and a half. And so that's going to influence it too. So your depth, how deep you breathe, how rapidly you breathe is going to affect this minute ventilation. And just remember, at VLR, just subtract the dead space, which out of 500 would be like 150 mils. All right. Some other uh, uh, respiratory movements, but not related to, uh, to respiration, uh, is uh, coughing and sneezing. It's a big deal now in our current situation. But these are ways that we can clear our respiratory tract. And uh, coughing is when you take a deep breath and then you, you you push the air up forcibly with your diaphragm, often your abdominal muscles as well, and the glottis or the, the air opening stays closed and then it's, <laughs> it's opened quickly and the air is forced up forcibly and it helps clear the lower uh, respiratory tract. Sneezing is when you make a powerful burst of air come up and then you, your uh, soft palate, your uvula will close off the oral cavity so the air is forced through your nose. And so that's gonna clear um, mucus or any obstruction in your, your upper respiratory tract. So they're very similar, coughing and sneezing. One uh, clears the lower, one clears the upper, and it's used by a rapid uh, movement of air to do that. Oh yes, yeah, so and then laughing and crying. These are, can be difficult to distinguish if any of you have been there. Uh, you gotta look at the, <laughs> the situation and look at the expression, but uh, uh, you're just um, releasing air uh, rapidly, yeah, that kind of a uh, deep breaths kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about. Um, hiccuping, it's where you uh, you have a spasm of your diaphragm. We're not sure what causes this. Um, somehow this phrenic nerve and in your, your brainstem, it's sending these signals to hiccup and you hear the sound as air is forcibly, you know, uh, comes off in these, these spasms. Uh, yawning. You know, I remember I was taught, I heard somewhere it's when your blood, the oxygen gets low in your brain and your body yawns to bring in a big, a big breath, but I guess that's not really proven. Uh, it is contagious. You'll see even other animals, lions, and chimps, that when one individual yawns, the others will. Uh, so maybe it's involves some kind of social bonding, uh, some alertness. Uh, so we don't know it's the, the absolute. Um, function of yawning or hiccuping seems to be just a, an issue. Um, and then speech, of course, you're listening to me now, I'm controlling my breaths as they come up. If I want to speak louder, I will push out more air. And I change the pitch, remember, with the vocal folds. We went all through that too. Um, and then the sounds are modified by my lips, my mouth, my tongue. Uh, all these things modify the sound. Even my sinuses will change the tone of my voice. Yeah. Cool. All right, then finally talk about a couple uh, issues and diseases. Asthma. Asthma, some of you out there have asthma. Uh, it's bronchioconstriction. It is going to be your tubes are constricted. And remember earlier in this lecture, it's, it is a problem breathing in, but it's even more a problem breathing out. Because as you breathe in, your lungs, the elastic tissue, the tubes are all expanding. But as you try to get rid of that air, everything is collapsing, including those tubes. And that diameter of the tube is critical. The smaller the diameter, the greater the resistance. It's like trying to breathe through a little cocktail straw versus a big, big straw. Um, and so that's a problem, it's actually getting rid of air. Um, and what causes this asthma? Well, it's, uh, uh, in many cases, it's not known a lot of, some of the, the factors, people can have exercise-induced asthma or cold or occupational uh, um, um, allergens uh, or, um, or just allergens. When you look at your environment, maybe it's ragweed, maybe it's dust, things that are, are causing an immune reaction in your bronchi that cause them to constrict and to secrete more mucus. So the two ways, really, you can have a smaller tube is that the muscles are going to constrict and then you're gonna secrete more mucus, or in 
cases where there's a, the immune system is overreacting. You have exudates from fluid uh, from the bloodstream or from white blood cells. But when you ever have fluid, it's going to be um, making that, that tube smaller. So those two factors. Um, and in asthma, it's, re it's reversible. If you get an inhaler, drugs, steroids, and inflammatories, it's going to loosen that up and you can breathe again. So asthma is a reversible condition. And people that have asthma between asthma attacks, they're often fine. Uh, let's take a look here. I just I was looking this up. Um, children uh, they often grow out of asthma. So you can see when you look at percentage that children are at the highest there. Um, there's some evidence early, early on that more boys than girls have it, but that definitely switches so that uh, more females have asthma than males. Yeah. And looking Maine is up there looking at percentage of adults is one of the, the uh, ones with a high percentage. Now, you're probably going to say, you know, why do we have asthma? What's the cause? Um, looking at its um, distribution, ep ep epidemiology of it. You look at it and you see, oh, I have the U.S. Oops, sorry. You look at the U.S., Canada, England, let's see, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand. And it looks like uh, speaking the English language is a factor. No, probably not. It's a correlation, but uh, causation is highly unlikely. Um, you can see also Brazil and Peru up there as well. In some of the lower countries, you see uh, China, Mongolia, uh, Russia, Finland, uh, some other places there. Um, so it's it could be related. There's one idea, this hygiene hypothesis, that um, we are coddled <laughs> as children. Now we have antibacterial soap, antibacterial toys, you know, everything. And our current uh, situation is even even greater. But they find that children that grow up uh, homeschooled without pets uh, and more in isolation clean environment tend to have higher rates of asthma and allergies. Um, if you have a lot of colds, you know, if you're exposed to other children and like in, in a dirtier environment, um, you see lower rates of asthma. So this hygiene hypothesis is that your body's overreacting to allergens as an adult uh, and uh, hypersensitized your, your, your cells are. And, uh, yeah, and so your body um, overreacts. And if you weren't so sensitive, uh, you wouldn't have the asthma. No. Yep. Cool. And many of you out there have inhalers, have asthma. Uh, you have a chance of growing out of it, but maybe not. If it's exercise induced, you just need to be prepared for that. Or you can avoid the allergens often, but things like ragweed, you can't really avoid. So people with asthma, you know, it's, it's hard, depending on what your, uh, your antigen is, it might be hard to avoid it. All right, secondly, a great cause of death is a COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And uh, it's up there with heart attacks, strokes, cancer. And um, the two main causes are uh, chronic bronchitis. Uh, this is when your bronchi clinically is defined as uh, three or more months of the year, you have coughing with sputum and for two years in a row. Like, clinical definition. So you can see you have a constant cough, your, your bronchi are filled with, with, with mucus. Um, and the other one's emphysema. And it turns out people with COPD have both of these usually, it's just um, which one is more prevalent. And emphysema is when the alveoli break down and coalesce into these big bubbles. And so a lung should look like a dense sponge. But the emphysema, you have these big holes, obvious bubbles, and I've seen these on, on cadavers. It's usually in the superior part of the lung, and you'll see it gets these big balloons in it. And so this has very little surface area compared to the nice delicate alveoli. And so the surface area goes down and down and down until you have less and less oxygen uh, being able to be exchanged. Emphysema is uh, almost always caused by smoking or working on a coal mine, something like that. Um, and it's there's no cure. Uh, it's it's degenerative. Your, your lungs get worse and worse, and they can they can remove a chunk of the lung and it can help with breathing. But uh, there's no going back uh, from emphysema. Your lungs don't get better. 
And lung cancer, although it's not the most common cancer, is one of the deadliest. You can see uh, worldwide, it's the most cancer deaths. deaths. The reason being is that the lungs are just so critical to life. Um, as a tumor uh, grows in your lung, it takes up more and more lung tissue. You can see over here the white mass like that. And you have less and less lung function. Your, your blood oxygen goes down, organ, other organs suffer. And you can get a lung transplant, but often lung cancer spreads. Uh, because it's how vascular the lungs are, it's going to spread to other organs. And, and if it spreads to your bones, your brain, uh, you're not going to be a candidate to get a lung transplant. So that's why it's a deadly one. And then you can see here emphysema, this beautiful uh, transverse section. You can see all these, these holes, right? These holes are where the alveoli have coalesced in these big <clears throat> bubbles, which are pretty much useless for gas exchange. And causes of lung cancer, obviously. Smoking up there, pollution, radiation, sure. Some of it's genetics, definitely. Radon here in the Northeast is a lot of granite and uranium. Uranium or other, I don't know if it's actually uranium, but it's um, a radon gas you might see in your basement here and, and, and uh, being trapped there, but that can cause um, uh, cancer as well. And I put a website there you can 